In the previous video, we went over some basic terms and ideas that will be helpful throughout this series. And now we'll be harvesting lumber and processing it into staves. I'm going to be using a bow saw for felling and the tomahawk for cleanup. I'm looking for a hickory tree that's four to seven inches in diameter. For me, the choice of species is based on availability as well as quality. I do believe Osage Orange is the best bow wood in North America, and various others are close competitors with Osage or Hickory, each having their own strengths and weaknesses. A wood more directly available to me while still similar to Osage is Black Locust, and I will be using a stave of it later in this series. If you want to know more about bow wood and why to pick one over another, I highly suggest you read Ryan Gill's book, The Secrets and Science of Primitive Archery. While I don't have his extent of hands-on experience, I do trust his work and knowledge is sound, so I'll link his book below. Something I am experienced with, and will echo Ryan on here, is not picking inferior material if you want the absolute best bow possible. When you can, avoid severe knots, wiggles, and bends. If you spend more time finding just the right material, you'll spend less time messing with it later. Along with Black Locust, Hickory is the most easily attainable quality bow wood for me. As you may notice, there are plenty here. The desirable size comes down to what tools are used and how much you want to sweat over splitting out staves. I do prefer not to use trees that get very far below 3 inches in diameter. Typically the curvature of the tree is pretty tight, giving the bow's back a high crown. This concentrates areas of stress and lends itself to a greater potential for limb failure. Oh, and as you're watching, you may ask why I didn't drop the tree into the clearing toward the camera. There were actually a couple of worse hangups on that side that are hard to see. Also, I'm no expert in felling, so I really recommend you get help or advice from the right people. You can see this trunk is 7 inches at the base, pretty straight and free of major limbs for about the first 15 feet. That's perfect for getting several nice staves out of. I'm now cutting the usable portions into two logs. Where possible, it's not a bad idea to cut them longer than the bows would be. This, along with sealing the ends, will help protect your bow material from checking or cracking. Next up is splitting the logs. You can store them unsplit with the ends sealed and bark on, but between potential bug damage and the drying time, I'm choosing not to. Leaving bark on wood will often invite insects that bore into the bark to lay eggs and their larvae will feed on the sapwood underneath. An alternative to bark removal is to spray the bark with insecticide. Woods like Osage, Mulberry, or Black Locust, where sapwood is typically removed for bow making, are less exposed to bug damage with bark left on, as the insects generally stay in the sapwood. When you split a log, you need to start in the center of the growth rings rather than the center of the log. Splitting a log into staves this way helps keep the split from inadvertently running out the side of the log and ruining staves. By the way, stave is the term that is generally used to refer to the split piece of wood that has not yet become a functional bow, and we'll be making several of them here by splitting these logs. After driving a splitting wedge into the end of the log, I work along the side, alternating wedges as one frees up the other. With larger logs, you'll likely find you need more wedges. Based on the width of the bows I intend to make, I can split some of these half logs again to make quarters. Preventing drying checks or cracks can be done by applying a sealer to the ends of the logs or staves. I've used paint and finishes, however glue makes a really nice barrier and I prefer it. Most white glues or hide glue will work great, and I just apply a thick coat to each end. As the wood dries, it will lose moisture through its most exposed surfaces faster, and this can cause mild to severe cracks. The stave or log ends are most susceptible and should be sealed soon after felling the tree. At this point, I'm removing the bark to speed the drying and deter bugs. Some tree species do better with longer dry times, but hickory can go straight from tree to a formidable bow just about as fast as you can dry the wood. More on that later in the series. Here you can see that I've used my draw knife to shave away the bark, and on the left you'll notice the brown cambium layer is still present. It's best to remove this layer as well. With white woods like hickory, where sapwood is used to make the bow, the back is very simple. When fresh cut and exceptionally wet, the bark and cambium can be peeled away from the staves with little effort. Wood that is somewhat dry can either be resaturated to produce the same result, 
or shaved until the bark and cambium are removed, as I am doing here. I've shaved this stave into sections to better illustrate these tree layers. The bark is on the left, with the cambium after it, followed by the sapwood. The bark is the outer protective layer, the cambium underneath helps grow the tree, and the wood under it is the result of the tree's years of growth. You'll also notice that I cut deeper into the wood towards the end of the stave, going below the outermost ring. In fact, I cut through multiple growth rings. This is known in bow making as violating rings. I'll highlight a few so it's clear what I'm referring to. When looking at wood from this orientation, the growth rings are stacked one on top of another. If you cut through these rings on a stave's back, as I have demonstrated here, this weakens the eventual bow's strength under tension. As a result, a heavy bow is much more likely to fail at a point of violation, as roughly demonstrated here on this small piece of hickory. Here's one more example of the staves in each stage. Bark on the left, cambium in the middle, and one continuous growth ring of wood on the right. In a later video, I will be demonstrating how to chase a ring, which means reducing the wood on the back of the stave or bow until one growth ring runs its entire length. However, this isn't necessary with undamaged white wood, as the sapwood or outer wood is strong under tension, which means the wood directly under the bark and cambium is suitable for the bow's back. For now though, I'm going to show you how to deal with knots. Knots are generally where a limb once grew or where the tree was prepared to put on a new limb. Either way, caution should be exercised so that you don't violate the rings at the knot. Working away from the knot rather than to it can sometimes help avoid mistakes. But what's important to keep in mind is that the wood here is raised, just like the bark above it. If you cut straight across the knot, you will violate rings. So just go easy, peeling and scraping small amounts away at a time. You can even switch to a smaller blade if desired. I know there's a hell of a lot to take in if you were new to all this, so don't feel discouraged if you need to watch this video several times. And please, ask me any questions you have down in the comments. I will respond to as many as I can. We're really going to dive into shaping some bows here before long, and I cannot wait. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. Thank you all so much for watching. See you again soon.